one problem, technical issues, but they happen, like I said. Okay. So actually, I'm going just uh, to say glimpse on the rare bleeding disorders, because this is important. Of course, Dr. Suzanne and um, Dr. Dahlia pointed this, but I just want to highlight just a specific issue. The definition of rare or even ultra rare congenital bleeding disorder is arbitrary. Um, though that the uh, coagulation, of course, the platelet function disorders and their um, um, incidence is um, quite variable and actually you cannot pinpoint it um, to a specific number. But regarding the coagulation factor deficiency, they would range, they would range from one to 500,000 to one to two million. And usually the most prevalent worldwide is the factor seven deficiency. However, these numbers vary if we consider separately symptomatic from asymptomatic and also severe from non-severe factor deficiency. And that specifically applies to factor seven deficiency. Also, in some populations, the incidence of some factor deficiencies, for example, as factor 11 in the Ashkenazi Jewish population is much commoner, one over 450. And also in Egypt, as you're going to, as um, if you look up this paper, you will see that the fibrinogen disorders are um, the commonest among the rare coagulation disorders, followed by factor seven deficiency. Um, this is an important issue regarding factor seven deficiency. The choice of laboratory agent is critical. So more factor seven deficiencies are found with recombinant thromboplastin as compared with old non-recombinant ones. Okay, so as our title says, we are going to go through the real life experience of inherited factor seven deficiency. And that real life experience will involve two aspects will involve the seven or the STEER, or, uh, the seven treatment evaluation uh, registry or the STEER, as well as our own experience of our unique cohort. So regarding the STEER, this is the biggest factor seven deficiency registry. It's, it was actually designed as a prospective observational multi-center web-based registry. And that's because factor seven is a rare disorder. And it was designed to collect the demographic as the, and the clinical baseline information, as well as describe data on treatment modalities and outcomes in patients with inherited factor seven deficiency so that um, uh, doctors and patients can share their experience because definitely this is a rare disorder. And the best way to tackle a rare disorder is through registries and web-based web registries. This registry includes males and females of all age groups not just the pediatric age group, but we are going to highlight the pediatric age group later in our cohort. And it includes those with um, factor seven, less than 50 of the of no, of normal, of course, or mutation known to be associated with factor seven deficiency and for whom treatment and prevention of bleeding was considered necessary by the treating physician. Um, also, it's going to involve um, um, therapy, whether um, a replacement or in demand or prophylaxis data. The replacement therapy for bleeding episodes and surgery uh, is going to be only for patients with a clear risk of bleeding. And that's defined here as, though you will see contrary to this later, and this is defined here as a uh, factor seven activity less or equivalent to 20%. For prophylaxis, only patients with severe phenotype were enrolled and accounted for 89% of patients with a factor seven activity of less than 1%. So regarding the demographic characteristics, as you will see here, it's more prevalent in females and that actually correlates with our cohort. And you will see that most uh, bleeders are minor rather than major. And of course, a significant number of patients are asymptomatic or called non-bleeders. Regarding the concentration or the factor activity of factor seven, you, of course, the major bleeders will have um, less factor activity. But then there are 
a, a difference in different populations and uh, among different patients, and even there is intrafamilial heterogeneity. So as Dr. Suzanne previously pointed, there is usually no correlation between the factor seven activity and the risk of bleeding or the severity of bleeding. But usually the severe bleeders would have a factor level of less than 3%, as, as this is also indicated here in the registry. Age of first bleed, of course, of the major bleeders, it would start much earlier. And uh, regarding the diagnosis, usually the minor bleeders would be diagnosed at a much later age or much older age. Okay. Recompent factor 7A in treating the bleeding episodes. As you're going here to see in these graphs that it's, um, its efficacy is quite high and usually ranging from excellent to effective, and effective means that it stops the bleeds in um, more than 80%, okay? And also the same here applies for surgery, and we usually, we don't need too many doses. So it would resolve the bleeding rapidly, and it can be used for the prevention of the bleeding episodes, and it has a favorable safety profile. And why is that? Because only in the registry, um, I mean, in the whole registry, there were only three thrombotic episodes and only one um, related to recompetent factor 7A, as well as a few other adverse events. But actually, it's, it's quite safe. How about surgery? Surgery is always an important thing to be aware of. And again, preparing patients for surgery and for interventions is very important. So patients less with, with a, a factor 7 activity less than 3% received a higher number of doses and received the um, uh, factor 7A for longer duration, but with no difference in the dosing itself. And definitely this correlates with the those with the major bleeds. So Either those with less than 3% or those with major bleeds, usually they would require higher, uh, higher dosing and longer duration, but no difference in the dose itself. A multivariate analysis was done in this tier and showed that the history of major bleeding was the only independent predictor of the number of recomponent factor 7A doses and duration and the perioperative dose of around 30 microgram per kg, and that actually correlates with our experience, but usually I would make it around uh, 30, is quite effective in more than 90%, or actually closer to um, 96%. And usually we would give the dose about eight times. Of course, again, the management plan in general or rare coagulation disorder and factor seven in particular because factor seven is quite unique and for surgeries in particular it's individualized for every patient and it's more guided by the bleeding history rather than by um, factor activity so the bleeding profile in our pediatric factor seven cohort which is composed of 42 patients more prevalent in females and the age ranges from day one in the neonatal period up to um, 18 years, and they are usually of a consanguineous marriage. Contrary to steer here, that we have a quite significant number of major bleeders. And with major bleeders, we mean those with hemarthrosis, GI bleeding, or cerebral bleeds. But the thing is, usually, we are a tertiary center, and usually we get all the severe bleeders referred to us. So there can be a, some bias here. But anyway, so 40.5% 40, uh, are major bleeders, 45.2 are minor bleeders, and 14.3 are asymptomatic or simply diagnosed after hemostatic screen prior to surgery. Now, the relation of the bleeding in, to our factor seven activity. Well, this is usually um, the, um, 
um, coincides with what we found in, with what was found in steer that severe hemorrhagic disease for a plasma level of less than two percent patients with plasma levels more than 20 percent can be asymptomatic but some patients may bleed with levels ranging from 20 to 50 and sometimes this bleeding is severe as we are going to say in to see in one of our patients now what did the steer come up with that 50% of patients experience a mild clinical picture that mimics that of a platelet disorder. And 15 to 20% have life or, or limb threatening hemorrhages. Now, how does that correlate with our cohort? 64.7% of our patients presented with, not, it doesn't, it, not necessarily initially, but a significant number initially with cerebral bleeds. So we really, so this rings a bell here. We really have to think it to diagnose it. Now, case review one. So this, this cute boy is a seven year old who presented at the age of four months with right semiconvulgence, fever, pallor, vomiting, and a high pitched cry. Typical manifestations of a cerebral bleed. CT showed subdural collection and the hematoma was evacuated baby received replacement therapy. Recovery was uneventful. Unfortunately, the uh, baby was discharged and um, he did not follow up. Actually, he was not told to follow up. At the age of five months, he developed a spontaneous bruise of the chest and the back. His laboratory results showed a very prolonged PT, a very prolonged INR that can be sometimes confusing to many physicians, including hematologists, and the factor seven activity of less than 1%. Now, this child is a major frequent bleeder who exhibited most of the entire array of bleeds described in congenital factor seven deficiency. As we saw here, he had a cerebral bleed, actually he had five cerebral bleeds, but because he was started on a diagnosis, the, the bleeds were usually mild with um, very little, or even negligible residual CNS damage. And that also was attributed because he was started on FFPs of fresh frozen plasma. We are going to see here how um, um, the life of this patient varied when he received the plasma as compared when he received the recombinant factor 7A. So again, back to his bleeding profile. So he was a, a major frequent bleeder who developed intracranial hemorrhage, ichemosis, easy bruising, usually spontaneous, Bleeding per rectum, oral bleeding, whether gum bleeding or, and that's quite unique to factor seven deficiency, dental cysts on teeth eruption, small hematomas and subcutaneous bleeds. And actually a lot of these bleeds were spontaneous as Dr. Suzanne referred previously. Epistaxis, bleeding from the ears, heme arthrosis. All bleeding episodes, their severity, treatment, received, and outcome were documented, and patient was followed up regularly every three to six months. So actually, this is prospective data. Regarding replacement therapy in factor seven deficiency, just a glimpse because this is going to explain what we are going to see later in our patient. So replacement therapy with FFPs has a low potency and a limited efficacy usually unsuitable for surgery and can lead to circulatory overlift, as we all know. Whilst recombinant factor 7A has a high potency regarded as the treatment of choice for inherited factor 7 deficiency, as well as acquired, by the way, and the dose is 50 to 30 microgram per kg at the four to six hour intervals. And it persists extrava uh, extravascularly bound to pericytes. And actually that explains in some of our patients, the cumulative effect of recombinant factor seven. And evaluation, efficacy, of, uh, sorry, efficacy evaluation is performed six hours after replacement therapy. Two, excellent single administration leading to complete cessation of overt bleeding and related symptoms, effective, more than one administration is needed. Partially effective, more than one administration is needed, but symptoms subside slowly and the return of the limb and joint mobility is partial, ineffective, of course, no changes and not evalu evalu evaluable, no, no elements for evaluation were available. 
So, actually, uh, this picture I think is very important because whether the picture of the patient himself or the MRI, which shows, as you can see here, diffuse thickening of the left ankle joint. Of course, he has um, his target joints are both the knees and the ankles, and sometimes the elbows. But here uh, we are highlighting the, the MRI changes in the uh, left ankle joints, uh, cortical erosions, moderate effusion of the tibial tailor and the subtalar joints. This is actually what we see in severe hemophilia and the typical chronic synovitis. So, and sometimes we refer to this as the hemophilia type factor seven deficiency. Regarding his treatment, as we said before, he was started on FFPs or fresh frozen plasma with an initial good outcome because his subsequent cerebral bleeds did not uh, were not uh, severe. Oh, actually, they were mild, not even moderate, and they did not leave any residual CNS damage. His epistaxis showed an excellent response to a combined therapy of recombinant factor 7A and FFPs. And that's when we managed to get recombinant factor 7 for him on demand. Uh, and that's also applied for the bruises as well as for the oral bleeds. So, uh, so excellent response in all bleeds except the heme arthrosis. It was initially only partially effective, that is the FFPs. And together with the recombinant factor 7A, it showed a great, uh, I, mean, I mean, a better response. But then when we were able to put him on prophylaxis with the recombinant factor 7A alone twice weekly, his life was totally different. Okay, so this is our second patient. So as you see here, this is how she started off and this is how she ended up. So she is, this patient is quite interesting. This is a 17 year old who presented with bleeding gums, hematuria, bleeding perictum. So her ISTHBAT was 35, it was quite high. And she was diagnosed at the age of five years with factor seven deficiency, a factor seven of 33%, which was repeated several times and it was always 33%. Yet her bleeding phenotype was so severe. In addition to all these bleeds, she developed menarche at the age of 12 years, and that's when she started having menorrhagia. She was admitted because of her menorrhagia to hospital 10 times, and she only responded to recombinant factor 7A. And she usually would respond to a one to three doses. And when she had a weekly dose of recombinant factor 7A, that changed her life. Her menorrhagia is controlled when she used to have it, to have it for 15 days and to transfuse packed RBCs. And of course, she wasn't able to go to school. But a weekly dose of recombinant factor 7A changed her life not only for the menorrhagia, but also for the other bleeds. As you can see here, this is her picture. Of course, this is per I took permission from the patient. So, hemothrosis, a severe facial bruise with an underlying hematoma, hemothrosis again, and hemothrosis of the elbow. And remarkably, the all always she showed excellent and effective treatment and that only required one to three doses. So our third patient is quite challenging because this is a patient who underwent surgery. He's a 16 year old of a consanguineous marriage who presented, actually he had um, a history of um, two cousins dying, uh, undiagnosed of the similar condition before. He presented at the age of six months with bleeding gums and epistaxis. And very interestingly, he was circumcised and he never bled. 
he was diagnosed as having factor 7 deficiency and his factor 7 is less than 1%. He developed later, of course, this is his whole bleeding profile or bleeding spectrum. He developed ecchymosis, post-traumatic post -traumatic and spontaneous, post-injection and post-vaccination, and then his cerebral bleeds at the age of One, um, one year and eight months with um, a very, very minimal residual damage. And he was started on a weekly prophylaxis and he was doing well. When he was started on a weekly prophylaxis with plasma, he then started developing bleeding per rectum and hemarthrosis uh, simply because the prophylaxis stopped because he uh, didn't show for follow up in our hospital and he went to another hospital, unfortunately, and that's when he really is comped and he started having um, severe bleeds. A uh, patient was prepared for synovectomy with a single dose of Nervo 7, and that's in correlation with what we saw in STEER. Okay, regarding the glandsman from the Athenia registry, it was launched to prospectively gather, evaluate information on the different treatment modalities and their outcomes in patients with glandsman in real-world clinical practice. So, regarding the non-surgical bleeding episodes, reports effectiveness and safety of recomponent factor 7a, plus or minus, as we are going to see later, other treatment options for the treatment of non-surgical bleeds in patients with glandsman with or without antibodies against platelets and refractoriness to platelet transfusion. Um, surgical, as, as for surgical interventions, reports effectiveness and safety, or again, of recombinant factor 7a, plus or minus other treatment options for the management of surgical procedures. Whether for patients with or without antibodies, whether or not refractory for platelets transfusion. Okay, this is well delineated here. Whether regarding the um, non-surgical bleeding or the surgical. And regarding the efficacy of recombinant factor 7a as a monotherapy and with other hemostatic agents in non-surgical and surgical bleeding, you will see here how effective it is. Um, and that's when uh, it, it's quite effective when it was used with, um, with other hemostatic agents and here when it was used alone in up to around 90% uh, uh, 91% actually okay and as for um, surgical bleeding it was uh, quite effective, whether in major or in minor uh, bleeds. Um, and regarding the major bleeds with other hemostatic agents, it was quite effective. And with the minor bleeds, actually, it was if effective alone in more than um, 85%. Now, this is a very short case. You visit 12 year old who was diagnosed with thromboethenia when she presented by heavy menstrual bleeding at her first period. So she was initially diagnosed by her menorrhagia. She was admitted to ICU with a hemoglobin level of 6.5 gram per deciliter, received packed RBCs. She was hospitalized several times with the severe menorrhagia. Um, and the bleeding uh, only stopped when she received platelet transfusion. Um, unfortunately, she has menorrhagia twice per month and um, her pectoral chart is uh, uh, 1,200. Her abdominal ultrasound was done and that's a routine thing that we do for any patient with menorrhagia to exclude any ovarian cysts or other gynecological problems. She was started on hormonotherapy and she, she was not improving and the menorrhagia was negatively affecting her quality of life and school performance. So as you can see here, she's an ideal candidate for recombinant factor 7a. So in conclusion, Factor 7 deficiency is the most common of the rare coagulation disorders worldwide, where, where it does not apply to, uh, to our cohort in Egypt. A large proportion of patients with major bleeds had a mean factor 7 levels of less than 3%. 
Early tachinosis and pill management reduces morbidity and subsequent mortality, improving the patient's outcome remarkably, as we saw in our um, case studies. Recombinant factor 7A is the optimal factor replacement therapy for the treatment and prevention of bleeding episodes in factor 7 deficiency. Recombinant factor 7A represents an alternative therapy for patients with platelet antibodies and past all present refractionist to platelets. Recombinant factor 7A has a favorable safety profile with a low frequency of adverse uh, events, as we saw in our slides. And a very big thank you to our patients because I believe I owe them so much. And this is how our um, factor 7 um, deficiency patient who is in prophylaxis is and how he turned out to be. Unfortunately, this is a patient um, who was only in prophylaxis with um, uh, plasma for his uh, epistaxis. Severe, but um, but for um, intracr intracranial hemorrhage, it's not doing him good. As you see here, he had seven episodes and it left the residual damage. And this is the, our patient who has undergone synovectomy. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Maggie, for uh, this uh, clinical uh, uh, experience sharing. It was uh, insightful and useful for uh, the audience, and uh, I hope. Thank you very uh, much. Yes, and I hope we, we can always uh, use uh, Novo Seven either in factor seven deficiency or advancement thrombastinia, uh, because uh, as you, as you, as you mentioned in your first case, uh, the kid was uh, initially responsive to the fresh frozen plasma, but after a while he was not. Even yes. the, the bleeds were the, the severity of the bleeds were uh, were less. Uh, in severity. So can you elaborate more on this? Okay. So, um, regarding the use of um, recombinant factor 7A um, in general and in our cohort in particular, it's very important to use recombinant factor 7A as early as possible because it will minimize the damage that can happen. You saw three case reviews. Um, two of them were started on Novo 7 or recombinant factor 7A quite early. The third one was started on plasma, was doing well, but he was lost to follow up. And he turned up again when he had severe joint bleeds with severe chronic synovitis simulating a severe form of hemophilia, not just hemophilia. Of course, a severe form of hemophilia, not, all, not on prophylaxis even. So the thing is, with recombinant 7A, you can use, um, if, you, if you use it early, you will minimize their residual damage, whether to the um, CNS or to the joints, that's for starters. And even if bleeds happen, the damage will be minimal or there will be no damage. If you saw the patient um, who is now at, at the last slide, the thank you slide, you have two patients. One, I think this is can be more elaborative than anything. You have two patients. One who had recurrent cerebral bleeds and was on fresh frozen plasma, and the other one had recurrent cerebral bleeds and was on Novo 7. One had absolutely no residual CNS damage, and the other one had severe CNS damage. That's for the CNS. Now, for the joint bleeds, also, the boy that you saw at the last slide, who is now 10 years old, actually, um, his joints, though there is an element of chronic synovitis, because we were not, unfortunately, able to put him on prophylactic Novo 7 quite early, but then his joints are much, much better, and the mobility is much, much better than the other child who was not able to use the, the one that we did sign synovectomy for, who was not able to use um, the, of course, because of resource constraint, the Novo 7. 
though when we prepared him for, for also again for with Novo Seven, he did really well. So really, recombinant factor seven A is quite magical for patients with inherited factor seven deficiency, and I see it also as quite promising uh, in Glanzmans, uh, and hopefully we will start enrolling patients on um, uh, on its. Uh, I mean, patients with Glanzmans thrombectomy. Yeah, thank you, Professor Maggie, on this. Uh, actually, when I was reviewing the, uh, the latest version of uh, the WFH annual global survey, I just noticed that uh, uh, we have uh, Glanzman thrombostemia patients that represent 14% uh, of the global uh, diagnosed patient. Uh, yes. But in your presentation, you mentioned that the most frequent RBD is the fibrinogenemia, uh, not, not even factor 7 deficiency, Glanzman or von Willebrand disease. Sorry, not from uh, Factor seven or glanzman from Bastinia. So, uh, do you so have I, I was, explanation? I, excuse me, I was referring to the uh, rare coagulation disorders. I mean, okay, with the rare, I usually divide the rare. It was in the first slide. The rare bleeding disorders into platelet function disorders. Yes. And coagulopathies yes. or rare coagulation disorders. Among the rare coagulation disorders, the fibrinogen disorders or the A fibrinogenemia in particular yes. is the commonest in yes. our Cairo University pediatric cohort and um, in Egypt. Yes. Um, why? Um, because uh, um, I've, I've done, um, I've collaborated um, with international collaborators and I've done mutation for our patients, and our and, and um, there are certain governates in Egypt, um, specifically um, Giza and Fayoum, where you have these mutations that leads to fibrinogen disorders or a fibrinogenemia. Yes. So that can explain, and you will find that there is an article that we published in Blood. OK, um, that included it's an international study that included our cohort with fibrinogen disorders. So that explains why do we have um, more fibrinogen disorders than uh, factor seven deficiency? Seemingly, this word is very important, seemingly, because, yes. again, if you remember what I said in my first slide, there are asymptomatic or non bleeders of factor seven deficiency. And yes. I think, um, again, that we are under diagnosing factor seven deficiency. Yes, especially patients who ha who uh, doesn't have uh, bleeding symptoms or manifestations. Exactly, yes. exactly. Around 50% are uh, asymptomatic. Excuse me? Uh, about 50% of the factor seven deficient patients are asymptomatic. Yes, yes, okay. Um, and actually, you you are going you you will not see this percentage in our Cairo University pediatric cohort simply because these patients will be diagnosed accidentally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we we will have the the bleeders and actually the severe bleeders referred to us, and that's yeah. why maybe that there will be some bias in our results. And so we need to start screening patients for factor seven deficiency because. Sometimes patients can have a very low factor seven activity and can be non bleeders yeah. and discovered accidentally. But then when these patients are exposed to, to hemostatic challenges like a surgical operation or when they are um, or, or, or an accident, then they can bleed or they can bleed severely. So we need to be more aware and to diagnose those patients. And actually, like there, there was um, the, the last patient I remember of those patients was a, um, a patient with uh, diagnosed with COVID. And we wanted to do um, an intervention for this patient. And when we did the coagulation profile, he turned out to be factor seven deficiency and we prepared him with Novo 7. That was like yeah. um, three weeks ago. Was it the first time diagnosis? Yes, yes. Okay. so. COVID and surgery and uh, concomitant diagnosis with factor yes. seven deficiency. Yes. yes, so interesting. Yes, it is. And it like is. I, I have, I had several cardiothoracic patients 
who were um, um, who had severe complex congenital heart disease, and they were referred to me for preparation again with Novo Seven. So it's very very important to. Uh, uh, to 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 think factor seven deficiency to diagnose it, and again, please, 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 even if the patient is a non bleeder, prepare him because there is no telling what will happen. Yes. Because some people will not prepare with Novo seven or will give plasma, and this is uh, I don't think this is um, appropriate practice because yes. this patient, if he started bleeding on table and you are not preparing him. It's going to be catastrophic, and you've got nothing to lose. Especially these are children, and you are losing, and you are using small doses. It's 15 to 30 micrograms per kg. Yes, I think uh, Professor Maggie, uh, Professor Dalia, Professor Suzanne, it's our responsibility as hematologists uh, just to uh, increase awareness about that the basic lab test before uh, any surgery, uh, PT, ABTT, because uh, as uh, Professor Maggie uh, had just mentioned. Uh, this patient was just diagnosed as factor seven deficiency before uh, doing a surgery. So before any surgical intervention, uh, we have to uh, to do uh, PT and APTT, and uh, not just uh, the bleeding time. Am I right? Of course you're right. Yes, of course you're right. Yes. It's um, and please because some people would do just um, the, the the PT, the PC, the INR. So, of course, PT is important for diagnosis of factor 7 deficiency, but then again, we need to do the whole COAG profile. A PT, a PC, a PTT, an INR, and a TT. Please don't forget the thrombin time if you have it available, because this is important for the fibrinogen disorders. Um, and uh, what you are saying, Amr, really uh, is very important, and that's why I don't know if you noticed or not, that um, I have now an, um, a, a PhD or an MD candidate who is going to start uh, uh, screening um, neonates for the uh, factor seven and the fibrinogen disorders. Yes, because the consanguineous marriage, especially as as you said, and uh, maybe in the governor, some governorates, especially in Upper yes. Egypt and Delta governed race, yes. I think yes. we have high frequency of factor seven deficiency glands, man, and fibrinogenemia, as you mentioned. Uh, also, uh, what you're saying about Upper Egypt is very important because mm -hmm. um, many of the patients with glansmans yes. are from Upper Egypt. Yes. So this prob this is there's probably mutations there that um, are um, that um, haven't been screened for, and that's why glansmans is more common in Upper Egypt than uh, the, the rest of Egypt. Yes. Okay, so um, any other questions or? So, I, I, I think uh, we, have, uh, we have reached it, uh, to the end of our meeting. Uh, uh, I don't see any further questions. So, uh, before we, uh, we close the, this webinar, uh, Dr. Suzanne, Dr. Dahlia, Dr. Maggie, if, if you have any concluding remarks, uh, anything you would like to add, just please go ahead. Fodal. Uh, uh, which may lead to a catastrophe. لو surgery حصل وحصل severe bleeding. Um. التليفون um, قالوا لي ان هم مش عارفين ياكسس التوك مش عارفين ياكسس اللينك مش عارفه ايه السبب فانا بس قلت اقول لكم كمان يعني طبعا احنا خلصنا يعني بس انا لقيت دلوقتي الناس بتعتني يعني كده فاي ثينك ان احنا ويكوردد ات صح؟ 
احنا الميتنج از ريكوردد وي كان شير ذا ريكوردينج مع الحضرات يس لان هم ذي ور ريلي انترستد يعني ف اوكي يس انا الحقيقه برضو هضيف تاني الحقيقه معلش سوري ان ان احنا كلنا عمالين نقول الكلام ده كتير بس يعني حقيقي هضيف صوتي تاني للدكتوره داليا وهقول لان يعني بليز يا جماعه بليز بليز حاجتين ذا سكريننج اوف اول بيشنتس ريجاردلس يعني مش لازم ان هو العيان يبقى هيعمل سيرجري او هيعمل اي انترفنشن انكلودينج ا توث اكستراكشن بليز سكرين ذا بيشنتس We've got nothing to lose. And the regulation profile is not But on the other hand, we can lose a patient. And I remember two patients. Alashen, they were not screened. And people were not thinking rare coagulation disorders has a long catastrophes. Patient, patient with factor V deficiency was diagnosed on table. The patient had cerebral bleed or intracranial hemorrhage. And no one thought that this might be a rare coagulation disorder. Okay. The the, uh, the one patient and uh, another patient had uh, severe uh, hemorrhage in both ovarian cysts with an acute abdomen, and she ended up doing total hysterectomy, a bilateral ophorectomy at the age of 18 years. Simply, Alashan and Ness were not thinking to diagnose a bleeding disorder, especially a rare bleeding disorder. احنا لسه في اماكن في مصر الناس يعني البيشنتس لان يعني I have patients from from different governates بالذات يعني مش هسبيسيفاي اماكن يعني اقول لهم يا جماعه يقولوا لي احنا لازم بنقول بنقول ان احنا هيموفيليا عشان الناس تعرف الناس مش مش اورينتد ان في حاجه اسمها بير كواجيليشن ديس اوردر وطبعا ده ممكن يؤدي لميس مانجمنت اوف ذوز بيشنتس وبعدين الناس فاكره ان الهيموفيليا كومن معلش برضو هي في بوينت انا احب اضيفها ان احنا عشان الكونسنجوينيتي اللي عندنا احنا عندنا بير كواجيليشن ديس اوردرز اكتر من هيموفيليا بي في الاذر بوبيوليشنز اوكي طبعا بير كواجيليشن ديس اوردرز In particular, our rare bleeding disorders in general. علشان ال ال consanguinity number one, number two, the fact that it closed the communities that we have. We have in Egypt, like in Gaza, we find that people who are married and have children who are the same age, like 100 or 150 years old, the same age. I don't mean from Gaza. I mean, for example, from the Ayyat, from the Badrashin, whatever. They find that they have children from each other. So this produces mutations that are very strong. وبيوجد بليدنج فينوتايب سيفير ويونيك. السيم كونسبت مع الاشكنازي جوش بوبيوليشن هم ليه عندهم هم مش مش حكايه كونسنجوينتي ما عندهمش كونسنجوينتي لكن هم they are a closed community. A closed community can be much worse عن الكونسنجوينتي. هي كمان لو في a very high prevalence of consanguinity زي عندهم. Thank you. Well noted the Dr. Maggie. Is that how you say? Fairly, that the 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 closed communities. We have been, for example, in places that are closed, for example, 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 و even حتى ال 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 indications أو ال red beans orders اللي هي كمان فيها في males حضرتك هتلاقي إن more than fifty percent من your patients فيها في males due to menorrhagia. صح. فا فبالتالي إحنا محتاجين فعلًا screening program بشكل على more scale على bigger scale و وكمان محتاجين إن إحنا provide those patients with the proper treatment زي زي novo seven أو other treatments if available. زي ما شوفت أنت برضو واحدة من the patients اللي أنا I presented ديت اللي عندها 17 years old دي المنوريجيا يعني هي inherited factor seven deficiency المنوريجيا عندها أسوأ من البلانس. بحدي لا يعني. أوكي. طيب إحنا في نقطة بس ما تكلمناش عليها دكتورة سوزان أو دكتورة داليا. الهرمون السيرابي في حالات المينوراجيا فاكتور 7 ديفيشنسي جلانزمان اذر بليدنج اس اوردرز ممكن حضراتكم تلابوريت مور يعني هل المفروض ان احنا نستخدم هرمون السيرابي امتى نوقفها هل مع 
مع النوفو 7 نستخدمها حاجة بس some guidance أو more guidance about this point لو سمحتوا هو الفيميلز أو البيرنتس بيبقوا دايما متوجسين من الهرمون الثيرابي في فيميلز صغيرة لسه نوت ماريد فما بتبقاش في اكسبتنس من البيرنتس ان هم يجو ثرو الهرمون الثيرابي او يتابعوا مع حد جاينيكولوجيست وانس ان هم اتشخصوا ان هو بلاد ديس اوردر او بليدنج ديس اوردر بالنسبه لي ما عنديش قوي مع الهرمون الثيرابي في العيانين دول لان هما وانس بيتشخصوا عندنا احنا بنبتدي نديهم نوفو 7 او بيبقى قبل نوفو 7 احنا حاولنا مع البليس ترانسفيوجن وده بيجيب نتائج يعني تيل ناو يعني فعلا زي ما الدكتوره داليا قالت احنا فعلا عندنا البيرنتس بيبقوا عندهم ريزيستنس للهرمون الثيرابي مش بس البيرنتس احنا عندنا كمان الجاينيكولوجيكال كونسلتيشن ما بيبداوش على طول الهرمون الثيرابي غير لو بدات المينولوجيا دي تاثر على الكواليتي اوف لايف يعني مثلا بتخش كل مثلا مره المستشفى بتاخد مثلا فاكتور او تاخد بليتلت او تاخد ايا كان الهيموستاتيك ايجنت اللي هي تاخده فبيبدا بعد كده بياخد بقى تاخد سيرونيت كهرمونال سبورت للاندوميتريوم بيمشي عليه فتره وبيوقفوه جراديوالي وبيعملوا ري اسسمنت للكونديشن بعد فتره من ستارتنج الهرمونال ثيرابي. اوكي طب طب هل الكونسيرن بتاع الاوبستريشنز هل فكره ال الكارسينوجينيسيتي بتاعه الهرمون الثيرابي بعد فتره لان هم طبعا هيستخدموه فترات طويله ولا في سبب ثاني في كونسيرنز ثانيه هو في مره كنت ناقشت مع واحد زميلي جاينيكولوجيست فقال ان هو ممكن لا هو البيرنتس بيبقوا من الانفيرتيليتي انفيرتيليتي دكتوره داليا حضرتك بتقولي صوت حضرتك راح بس دكتوره داليا طيب دكتورة سوزان تقدري تتفضلي على ما دكتورة داليا الصوت يرجع. هو بقول حضرتك كنت ناقشت مع واحد زميلي جاينيكولوجيست قال ان هو غالبا بيقولوا ان ممكن اول كام سايكل بيبقى فيه هرمونال امبالانس بيعمل اكسجريشن للمينولوجيا فصعب جدا ان هم بيقتنعوا بالنسبه للاهل الاهل فعلا بيبقوا خايفين من انفرتيليتي بتلعبوا في هرمونات البنت فعقبال ما اقنعهم لازم بيبقى فعلا حتى كذا مره مينولوجيا البيرنس هما اللي بيبقى عندهم كونسيرنس ريليتد للفيرتيليتي بس هو دي ميث يعني دي حاجه مش حقيقيه صح يعني حضراتكم تقدروا توضحوا لهم ده ممكن الكومنت يا عمرو اتفضلي دكتوره ماجي اتفضلي دلوقتي الحقيقه انا اتعامله كومبريهنسيف كير مع حد جاينيكولوجيست يعني حد سبيسيفيكلي بيسيل بيشنت ستوري اوكي ف دلوقتي الاول طبعا هو يعني الحقيقه significant portion من ال patients دول بي ممكن بي respond initially to transexamic acid سواء ال oral أو سواء ال IV بالنسبة لي ال hormonal replacement therapy إحنا بقى عندنا ال concept عند ال gynecologists مختلف عن داليا وسوزان إحنا عندنا ال gynecologists بالعكس على طول بيبدأوا هرمون ريبليسمنت ثيرابي حتى ايفن من اول سايكل وده وده ودوت مش يعني من وجهه نظري انا مش مظبوط. ف بس الحقيقه جزء لا يستهان به من البيشنتس بيبقوا يا اما انيشيالي انا ممكن اديكم حتى بالبرسنتج بس البرسنتج مش قدامي يا اما بيبقوا انيشيالي ريسبوندرز بعدين يبقوا نون ريسبوندرز يا اما بيبقوا نون ريسبوندرز من الاول. فعلشان كده الحقيقه أنا مع داليا رغم إن هم ما بيدقوش هرمونال ثيرابي لسبب تاني أنا مع داليا إن إحنا ب... ب... مهم وعلى فكرة الترانكسيميك أسيد إز فيري امبورتنت أز أدجنكتيف يعني ك... كفيرست لاين في المينوريجيا وكأدجنكتيف بعد كده مع الريبليسمنت ثيرابي فرجوعا ل... 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 مثلا كإكزامبل اللي هي ال... ال... البنوتة بتاعتنا إن فعلا ال... النوفو 7 تشينجد هير لايف توتالي وهي يعني لو هي خدت بروفيلاكتيك دوز قبل ما تجي لها المنسز المنسز بتقعد عندها ست بتبقى نورمال اكشولي نورمال خالص. ولو هي جات لها المنسز بتحتاج 1 تو 3 دوزز حسب امتى هي خدت النوفو 7 بتاعها. فيعني فعلا الريكومنديشن بيبقوا الحاجتين دول اكتر من الاتش ار تي او الهرمونال ريبليسمنت ثيرابي. اوكي. 
يعني يعني في الاخر حضرتك شايفه ان مش مش لازم نبدا مع كل البيشنس هرمونال ريبليسمنت ثيرابي حضرتك شايفه ان هو التايم يوز اوف نوفو 7 في وقت المينوراجيا يعني ذيس از افكتيف استراتيجي حضرتك ما بتمشي عليه ايوه ايوه بس على طول من الاول التوقيت أوكي. التوقيت هيعمل ايه هيجيب لي a very good response وهيمينمايز الدوزنج اللي هيتاخد يعني طب يعني حضرتك بتبداها امتى في اول يوم من المينوراجيا ولا بتبداها yes. امتى بالظبط يس yes. يس yes. أو الحقيقة الحقيقة أنا مثلا أنا ببتديها بروفيلاكتيك فاللي بيحصل لو هي البنت عارفة التاريخ بالظبط بتاعة بتاعة المنسس بتاعتها أنا طبعا هما المشكلة إن بيبقى عندهم إيريجولاريتي شوية لكن لو هي عارفة التاريخ بالظبط وبدأنا إيفن قبله الريسبونس هيبقى هايل بدأنا أون داي 1 الريسبونس برضه هيبقى كويس أوكي تمام يعني هو في الاخر كل ده لو هو في اول يوم من المنسس فهيبقى ريزلتس كويس. يس yes. ان شاء الله. اوكي. طيب في اي حد من حضراتكم عنده سؤال او حد من السبيكرز حابب يضيف كومنت قبل ما من من ما نكلوز الويبينار؟ طيب لو لو كده يبقى طبعا بنشكر حضراتكم طبعا سهرناكم معانا وسهرنا السبيكرز وثانك يو سو ماتش على الكيو اند اي سيشن والان ديبس ديسكشن اللي احنا اتكلمنا فيها حتى ايفن بره كمان النوفو 7 بس طبعا وي هوب ان احنا في الاخر كلنا ان احنا امبروف الكواليتي اوف لايف اوف ذوس بيشنتس وذ اورفان ديزيزز زي جلانز ان فاكتور 7 ديفيشنسي فور اذر اورفان ديزيز وهو ده دورنا مع حضراتكم وان شاء الله احنا دايما موجودين معاكم ونكرر ذس ذس ساينتفيك سيشنز اجين اجين وطبعا هنفضل دايما ات يور ديسبوزل ات اني تايم لو محتاجين طبعا النوفو 7 بنشكر حضراتكم جدا ونتمنى ان شاء الله نتقابل في اقرب فرصه وان شاء الله المره الجايه بقى تبقى ان بيرسون بقى تبقى فيس تو فيس ونشوفكم على خير باذن الله